Good afternoon and welcome to the Recycling Market Center Technology Tuesday webinar series. And this series of webinars incorporates recycled materials into environmental friendly applications and includes a case study of crumb rubber in a green, in a green roof medium. The RMC was established in 2004 as a nonprofit organization. We have five full time employees and we're located at Penn State Harrisburg with a satellite office in Pittsburgh. We have a nine member board plus four ex officio members. RMC programming includes this Technology Tuesday webinar series. Uh, we have presented webinars earlier on innovation and optical sorting technologies in September of last year and alternatives to disposal of gypsum wallboard waste in December of last year. These webinars are recorded and you can access them on the RMC website. We are pleased to bring you the Technology Tuesday webinar series. Depending on the topic, these webinars discuss research initiatives that evaluate the use of recycled materials in new products and applications, highlight various types of equipment used to sort and or process materials that have been collected for recycling, provide an overview of how this equipment works and the benefits the user <coughs> with regard to production of recycled material feedstocks and less contamination and potentially higher value. And when possible, we invite users of the equipment or techniques to discuss how the equipment or process has helped improve their recycling efforts. Today's presentation on incorporating recycled materials into environmental applications, a case study of crumb rubber in green roof media We'll have presentations by Dr. Catherine Baker and Dr. Shirley Clark of Penn State Harrisburg. The first speaker will be Dr. Clark, who's an associate professor of environmental engineering at Penn State Harrisburg. Her research focus is on the impact of engineered environment on nature and public health with focus on the impact of stormwater runoff on the physical, chemical, and biological quality of surface water bodies. Dr. Clark's current project areas include effectiveness of structural treatment technologies, non-structural management practices in removing pollutants from urban runoff. Our first speaker, Dr. Clark. Thank you, Jack. Um, what I really want to do is to talk a little bit about um, starting off with just the general discussion of what green roofs are and what their environmental benefits are. And again, we think about green roofs. I actually had somebody one time say, well, that just means you put it in green paint, right? It's like, no, trying to explain that it actually is a living vegetated roof. And again, we have a lot of benefits for doing that. We have certainly energy savings that are a big concern for building owners. Um, but other benefits that we're looking at, and not we particularly, and will not be the folks of this talk, but other areas of interest are certainly carbon sequestration, as we talk about the need for carbon seque sequestration in the urban environment. With that, the ability to reduce greenhouse gases. Some interesting areas of study that have been looked at are reduction of the urban heat island effect, basically making our cities more comfortable to live in, uh, potentially even encouraging habitat and biodiversity of wildlife in our urban areas. Um, my area of focus fits in with the stormwater management side, and certainly as people look at living in buildings and large-scale buildings in, in urban areas, the aesthetics of having green space to look at. Um, again, I'm going to focus a little bit and put a little bit of background on what, what I call the traditional green roof, and I'll talk then about what area of the green roof construction that we were interested in. Green roofs, again, and this is focusing on an extensive roof. When people think about green roofs, they also may be thinking about what's called an intensive green roof, which is basically your garden on a roof. It could include a, it could include trees, shrubs, and typically it's got a very uh, deep media and allows for um, bigger plants to grow. For many other buildings, we typically look at what we call an extensive green roof or a shallow media roof, 
which does not allow for plants to grow, but it does reduce the weight load that, can, that the roof is going to have to support. And our research is going to focus on the green roof. From a construction standpoint, it generally looks like the construction of a normal roofing material, taking with the insulation, the waterproofing. All we've done on top of that is add a drainage layer, a growth media, and the plants. Uh, the research we're going to talk about today is going to focus on particularly the growing media part of this. Again, taking a look at that piece of it and seeing if it is possible, instead of using the materials that have conventionally been used for those, is to be looking at uh, putting in recycled materials, again, both for the environmental benefit and simply hopefully to provide a market for those materials. Here are pictures of a couple of green roofs. The one on the left is on the uh, is at Barnard College in New York City. And again, other shots of that. And you can see how they can add to that urban environment as you look out of a hotel room, as I did this past weekend. Instead of looking at gray roofs and water tanks, you can actually see green space uh, with, that, with, with those roofs. Again, did I go the right direction? No. Um, and these are the types of plants that are on the green roof. Again, the idea is that they are typically very tolerant of the, of the conditions on top of a roof, variety of weather conditions, and a, a, certainly a variety of wet and dry conditions. So again, when we get into, when Dr. Baker presents, she'll be talking about the survivability of plants, because the bottom line is if you're gonna put in a green roof, you want the vegetation to grow and continue to grow. And we want this vegetation to be low maintenance. So survivability of plantings in our in this media is critically important. Um, just to give you an overview of what green roof media can, it consists of. Typically, it's a large component of what they call inorganic material. It's typically been um, things like expanded slates, expanded shells, clays. Take these materials, we think about them as, as the rocks, and run them, them through a heat and expansion and air expansion process to make them much more lightweight. Again, however, these processes are incredibly energy intensive. So again, what we were looking to do is to begin to replace that component with something else. The organic component typically is less than 20% overall. A lot of places have used uh, well-aged compost. Um, and again, the problem with the organic matter and why we typically keep that down in terms of percentage is that it can release nutrients into the runoff um, and also, it can, uh, it can be, usually comes off as very fine uh, particles and it will clog the permeable filter fabric. Again, the idea we want is to have enough water retention in order for the plants to grow. So working through that piece of it, um, the uh, German Landscape Research Development and Construction Society, and I cannot pronounce this German, but the, it's called FLL, has developed guidelines for the qualities that we want in a green roof media, looking at particle size distribution of the media itself, I'm not talking about the runoff water, but the particles of that, the density of the material, um, its water holding capacity and how much air permeability is in there, pH and salt content, again, thinking about growth media for the plants of choice, how much organic matter is in there, again, to plant growth and nutrients. So what we were looking at, and as we were putting together and looking at a variety of recycled media with a particular focus on crumb rubber for the inorganic component, Again, although we know it's a carbon, it is, uh, it's not that easily accessible to the plants. We, we consider to replace the expanded um, shale and slates that have typically been used. We were really looking to develop a media that would meet the FLL requirements because that is the, the, what people are looking for when they start installing uh, green roofing materials. So again, we want to replace and amend the owner organic component with the crumb rubber mixture and evaluate specific agricultural compost for use as the organic. We did do some work looking at biosolids or municipal um, wastewater treatment plant uh, composted solids as an organic re uh, uh, re uh, replacement also. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Just to kind of give you a reason why people are pushing for green roofs before we get into what we've done and what our results show. We know that buildings are about 68% of electricity consumption. Um, again, 40% of total energy use and a high amount of greenhouse gas emissions. So the idea is that if we can certainly cut down on the amount of energy that it's needed for these buildings, not only are we going to you know, potentially reduce the demand on particularly the electricity grid, but it also saves the building owner money. I mean, one of the big areas of study is that we are looking at um, reduction of, of, of air conditioning needs as many others are. The idea is that uh, green roofs that have got water in them, not necessarily saturated, but water in them, can absorb and store large amounts of heat. And again, by reducing temperature fluctuations in the building, you reduce the demand for, uh, particularly the air conditioning load. Again, if they're dry, 
or they've not, they're not that saturated, they can act as an insulator and decrease the flow of heat through the roof. Um, vegetation, we certainly know, can reduce surface temperatures and ambient air temperatures through shading and evapotranspiration, and they protect the underlying layers from exposure to wind. The idea also is that they, again, are great, uh, uh, the plants and the roofs are great interceptors of solar radiation. So again, we don't get the reflective heat back off of our, our, or radiative heat back off of our darker roofs that we often see in urban areas. So again, there's a tremendous interest in the energy issues associated with green roofs. Um, my focus is in stormwater management. And what we know is that, and particularly in many of our urban areas where we have tremendous problems of water runoff, certainly roofing in and of itself because of the area, the large area of urban land that it occupies, we certainly see uh, this great change. We need, see a need to slow down that water. Again, it, it, it reduc reduces the burdening on our sewer systems. So what green roofs can do, and this is a comparative study out of, out of our uh, Center for Green Roof Research where they looked at an individual storm, but we certainly see this across the board. We not only see a delay in the peak, even though it's not, you know, it's, it's only a, an hour or so, but we also see a tremendous drop in the uh, peak intensity. So we're getting at the peak of the storm or the peak of the runoff, we're getting less flow out, which again re, uh, provides pipe capacity in our storm sewer systems that we didn't used to have as we've developed the land. And it, and it delays it for a while, which hopefully then allows other runoff to have moved down through the piping system. And again, so we don't have overflows and basically backed up water in the streets and, and manholes popping off. So that's the general idea of what we're hoping for with that. So again, we know that putting in green roofs is that it can provide these stormwater management benefits. Again, we've done some past work looking at this. Um, again, we're in an area of the country here in, in the Harrisburg area where we have very low pH rainfall. We've done testing on campus as we were testing some of our roofing materials, and we found that our rainfall pH ranged from about 3.7 to on the nicer days around 6. Um, and again, that, that, you know, that's what turns our cars rusty, what turns our mailboxes rusty. So we compared that to um, many of the other roofs that we were, materials that we were looking at, at out there. And what we see in there is that we now get it up to, you know, above seven, which we actually end up in a, a slightly basic or a less corrosive, particularly to our, our gutter materials, to our, our, our streets and to our concrete piping systems. We end up with a runoff that is much, much more tolerant to not degrading those systems that we just paid for. So again, with that, it's like, okay, so green roofs have got a lot of good chemistry benefits. Now the question is with this is can we make them out of recycled materials. Again, we did take a look also at zinc, in which Dr. Baker will mention later in terms of our materials themselves. And, you know, again, many people out there have galvanized roofs on their storage sheds in other places. And we know that galvanized zinc is designed to wash off those roofs to protect the roofing under structure itself. And so we know that it's likely to wash off a, a great amount of zinc. And we are looking at, can we replace or look at encouraging green roofing instead of some of those roofs? So again, we're in for that, and even for many of the others uh, down at the uh, bottom, the asphalt shingles, the cedar shakes, et cetera, we're running above our, our, our concerns of concentrations in our streams for fish. So that's really what we were looking at with the green roofs. So again, what we end up doing with this is that we have compared uh, the, uh, a media made from recycled materials with a commercially available um, a green roof media. And what, we, what that media was, and again, it's, it was a, a, a local media, is the, their organic fraction was a peat moss based, and their inorganic fraction was expanded shales and other inorganic minerals. What we want to know is can we replace that with a uh, either composted municipal agricultural waste biosolids and the inorganic fraction with crumb rubber? Again, the idea being is can we look at that? Can we create a media out of these recycled materials that will function as well as commercial media in terms of meeting those FLL guidelines without adding other problems that we would consider from a water quality standpoint, which Dr. Baker will be discussing. Again, we have a tremendous issue with waste tires in this country. And again, you can kind of see where they all fall into um, there. And there's a sub substantial fraction in there in the unused category. And what we know is if we could certainly turn around and continue to reduce the size of that red unused category, we, we, we can and provide another outlet for the use of crumb rubber or shredded tires, then we do provide this benefit uh, to reducing the problems with, with tires and landfills and other areas. Well, so what we ended up doing was uh, talking to some of our local crumb rubber manufacturers working here through the Recycling Market Center. 
and looked at a couple of grades of chrome rubber and looked at then how do we mix them together in order to see if we can meet those FLL guidelines. And again, what we end up doing basically is going from the shredded, the crumb or the shredded rubber into a mixture. And you can see it in the second uh, figure down in the bottom on the, on the right of a 50-50 mixture of, of several different sizes of crumb rubber. Again, the first part of our testing was looking to see, will it meet the FLL guidelines for flow rate and water holding? And then, and then the bottom picture showing the issue of, of creating a variety of sources for the compost. So that's, again, a picture here now of what our green roof medium looks like. And we'll talk near the end about the fact we have several of them. Uh, we have a green roof out um, on a demonstration building uh, locally that's being compared to uh, a, a roof uh, in the next, basically, balcony that is um, uh, out of the commercial medium. Our project activities, we're basically looking, as I've mentioned already, we looked at mixtures of the crumb rubbers, different sizes of crumb rubbers, and comparing them for the hydraulics flow rate and comparing them to the FLL guidelines with a mixture. We have compared nutrient leaching to those guidelines and, and we've compared zinc leaching to that because zinc has been raised as an environmental concern that limits the use of crumb rubber. Um, so again, we wanted to see if that, uh, first of all, what, what, the zinc, what the zinc reservoir was in the tires and also particularly, to see what its leaching was into the runoff water that would be passing through it. So again, what I've done in here now is put on this slide and effectively, or effectively our, our crumb rubber mixture um, and our, our green roof medium, which includes the organic fraction and compost also. I just kind of want to show how we've kind of come back in and approached this and in terms of comparing it to the uh, FLL guidelines. We sent, we made our mixture I'm doing other testing, but we sent a sample of our mixture up to our um, Penn State Agricultural Analytical Laboratory, where they sta standardly test green roof mixtures against their FLL guidelines. And so I've put on here the results of the hydraulics side of the testing. Again, the particle size distribution, um, the bulk density measurements, the water, air, moisture uh, information. And what we see in general is that, again, we have played with several mixtures. We're meeting those guidelines in general. Again, a little bit low on the, uh, you know, slightly higher on the water permeability, um, but not by much. 0.71 to 0.67 is not, you know, a huge issue at that point. Um, we're a little bit low on the uh, maximum water holding capacity, which most people look at as an issue of plant growth, but not substantially. And we have also been doing plant growth studies, both out in the field and in the lab, to confirm that being a little bit off of that number is not a limiting factor at this point. So what we end up doing, again, is in this case, is the two blue lines are the particle size distribution recommendations for the medium, the media themselves, as recommended by FLL. And what we were targeting was to have our uh, our recycled uh, crumb rubber compost media fall in the middle of it. And what we see is that we are. So showing that we could take a mixture of crumb rubber and uh, and compost and actually mix it to start meeting these hydraulic guidelines. And then the next step we'll move along to will be testing the other environmental properties. Again, we've done it where we've looked at flow rate over time with loading, and we are certainly seeing that we were within the uh, requirements of the FLL guidelines for the dash lines are the upper and lower limits on a flow rate measurement, um, basically transferring it over to time, knowing how much water we put through there to see. And we can with with both the commercial media, certainly we would expect that we bought it knowing it would meet FLL guidelines, but both compost, and we could do it with biosolids also and get a mixture that would uh, meet the FLL guidelines. And it is you know, obviously very comparable also to the um, to the commercial medium again, which we want to. That's really what we were looking at: is that are we close to a commercial medium and can create a medium that meets the guidelines and has similar performance characteristics to that without having the challenges of how some of the commercial media components are created. And at this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to back to Jack Himes to introduce Dr. Baker. Okay, thank you, Dr. Clark. <clears throat> I would like to remind the audience that questions can be submitted by using the uh, question block uh, in your uh, screen go to webinar control panel. Uh, Dr. Baker is Associate Professor of Environmental Microbiology at Penn State Harrisburg in the School of Science, Engineering, and Technology. Before coming to Penn State Harrisburg, she ran her own consulting firm for environmental biotechnology and hazardous waste remediation. Her focus has been on appropriate and low impact technology. 
Good afternoon. Uh, one of the things I like to do um, whenever I talk to groups who are uh, predominantly individuals involved in construction and engineering uh, is start off with some disclaimers. Uh, one of the reasons Dr. Clark and I work so well together is she often characterizes herself as an engineer who knows enough biology to be dangerous. Uh, I am the other extreme. I am a biologist who knows enough about engineering to be a little bit dangerous. Uh, and so we complement each other's interests and each other's abilities, I think, quite well. That means what I'm going to be talking about are the things that you probably don't usually deal with in construction. You don't usually consider when you think about roofs. But as Dr. Clark pointed out so nicely at the very beginning of this, uh, a green roof is not a constructed roof. A green roof is a constructed living system. And you cannot look at green roofs without understanding that the organisms that are present, and that is both the plants and the microorganisms that are present, are going to have a profound impact on the way the system functions. So what I'm going to be looking at this afternoon is what happens in terms of nutrients that are contained primarily in the leachate, because we don't want this green roof to be a source of inorganic nutrients to run off, particularly types of nitrogen and phosphorus, because as I'm sure you're all aware, those are responsible for the growth of nuisance algae and nuisance plants in waterways that leads ultimately to the phenomenon of eutrophication and decreased water quality. I'm also going to be talking a little bit about what happens with a specific aspect of the bacterial component. Anytime you have soil or a soil-like material, you're going to have microorganisms present. And one of the concerns is what's going to happen in terms of potentially pathogenic microorganisms. Well, it turns out it's impossible to measure all of the pathogenic microorganisms that could be there. I know it's a little frightening to non-microbiologists, but we really don't have ways to enumerate all pathogens of the environment. But we do have our ways to, to enumerate indicator organisms. For those of you who work in drinking water or wastewater or have experience in those areas, you're probably familiar with coliforms. The organism that's used as the quintessential coliform is an organism called E. coli. And there's a presumption that if E. coli is present, they're going to be pathogens present. So we wanted to look to see is, is our green roof going to be giving off uh, coliforms? Is it going to be giving off E. coli and thus potentially associated with pathogens? And finally, that you know, sort of sine qua non of the entire green roof phenomenon, can we grow plants on this? Because it doesn't really matter what kind of characteristics we have chemically or hydrologically. If the plants won't grow, it's not going to be a green roof. So um, I'm going the wrong direction. That way, sorry. Yeah, OK. So the first thing we wanted to look at were these nutrients. Uh, the nutrients of primary concern here are going to be two. It's going to be phosphorus and uh, nitrogen, nitrogen in the form of nitrate and ammonium. And what we have here is a very simple summary where we've compared the average leachate characteristics of our recycled medium with the guidelines. And what you want to note is that in all instances, we meet the guidelines. Uh, so we're not generating excessive amounts of, uh, night of nutrients off of these green roofs. Now, I need to also sort of explain to you that this study started off with a green roof media in, on which we had planted grass seed. So this is the average both of the initial phase of the study where the plants were becoming established and growing and the situation in which the plants themselves had become uh, fully grown and were being simply maintained. It's kind of interesting if we look at the system and dissect it a little bit more, because the release of inorganic nutrients uh, from commercial green roof media has been associated with a fertilizer effect. Um, that therefore limits the release of runoff from green roofs many times into streams. And what we found was that in many instances, that apparent release of nutrients has to do with testing that is done on systems where the biology has been left out. 
And what we have here is the black line is simply our system looking at what happens when we don't have microorganisms present in terms of the amount of ammonia that is released from the system. And what happens when we spike the system by adding extra bacteria? And in this case, we use just a run-of-the-mill laboratory strain of E. coli. Uh, besides being an indicator, uh, E. coli is just probably the most commonly used microorganism for all research in the world. So we threw about 10 to the fourth cells of E. coli in. That's a very, very low dose of E. coli. And what we found, not unexpectedly, is that in the presence of biological activity, the nutrients will be controlled. There are nutrients present in the green roof media. There's certainly nutrients present in compost that can be leached from compost. But when there are organisms present, both microorganisms and plants present, they can take that up, convert it into living organisms. And when you think of organisms, think of them as kind of like the slow release time capsules of the nutrient world. Organisms take up nutrients, Ultimately, those organisms will die off, but when they die off, they decay very slowly and re-release usable nutrients into the environment. So you have a sustainable system. Uh, if we look a little bit at just what happened in the short term in our pilot systems, uh, if you look in the commercial media, there is a very high initial release of nitrate. This is commonly found in green roof systems where you have leaching of the materials initially, and then the levels of nitrate, the levels of nitrogen released uh, decline to a very low level, you get none of that type of initial release from the recycled media. Certainly all of this is still falling within those FLL guidelines. Total nitrogen, we see in the commercial media, a pretty profound initial spike with leaching, in ours, there is a small transient spike, but again, numbers level off down to levels that will not adversely impact on the environment. Uh, total phosphorus, the same general pattern at the very end. There's a little bit of kind of squishiness. I'm not sure what's happening with one of these data points for the commercial. Uh, but in general, what we find is that the release of phosphorus is higher from commercial media than it is from our recycled media. Again, remember, this is not the media alone. This is rather the green roof system where we have media, microorganisms, and plants all interacting simultaneously. All right, so what the conclusion here is, is that it appears that we can develop a media made out of recycled materials, uh, shredded tires and crumb rubber mixed together, to supply the structural inorganic material where we're not going to significantly increase the release of nutrients and the potential for eutrophication. In fact, we're doing as well or better than commercially available media. All right, this is the, 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 the second aspect we're interested in, which is the indicator organisms. In general, bacteria were not detected in the leachate of green roof media unless it had been spiked with additional E. coli. That indicates that indigenously, we don't have microorganisms, and that dashed line up there is about 200 microorganisms per milliliter, which is the recreational water standards that must be met by, uh, that are established by the EPA for, for uh, recreational water quality. Now, what happens, interestingly, when we spike the media is that we did get a significant increase in the concentration of E. coli when we had biosolids in the media, uh, sewage sludge, uh, but we didn't in either the commercial or the recycled media with compost. A um, couple of sort of uh, explanations I have to give here. And Dr. Clark has mentioned that we began looking at biosolids and then we didn't, didn't really continue with biosolids. Part of it is this problem with the regrowth of microorganisms, although we think we have an idea as to what's going on there and how we would be able to control for that. 
Much more importantly, this research was done several summers ago, and uh, it was the time when we had a very significant flood in the area. Our source of biosolids is a local wastewater treatment plant, which was underwater. So our biosolids, I would like to say dried up, but unfortunately we had the opposite problem and we could not get the kind of biosolids that we wanted to continue this work. We're now back online. Uh, hopefully, I think it would be even better if you could have um, shredded tires and biosolids, two recycled materials within um, the recycled green roof media. We certainly know that we can control the possible uh, presence of pathogens using this one shredded tire recycled media. And then again, the, you know, the final thing to mention here is just sort of the proof in the pudding. Uh, these are two little flats uh, that we've planted in this particular case with Kentucky bluegrass. Now uh, you notice that's very different from the plants that you saw earlier. One of the things that I think is important and that is biologically important is that we try and determine if we can plant plants other than conventional green roof plants. The plants that are traditionally used in green roofs are plants called sedums. They are alpine plants. Uh, it's actually more appealing to think, can we plant indigenous plants? Can we plant such things as grass? Can we even, in some instances, and the first picture you saw of that Barnard College uh, green roof, they're trying this, use the green roof as a way to conserve endangered species of plants. So what we've done here is we've simply taken our commercial medium on one side and the recycled medium on the other side, put the same number of grass seeds in each of those little pots and left them to be watered on a regular basis with synthetic rainwater. And what you can see both visually, I think quite nicely, and what simply counting the number of seeds that germinate it indicates is that there's no difference whatsoever in plant growth. So we have no increase in the runoff of nutrients. We have no increase in the uh, presence of pathogenic microorganisms, and we get the same kind of plant growth. My conclusion as a biologist is that the actual inorganic component may not be um, the determining factor, isn't the determining factor. Uh, what's important is that we provide structure to the plants, to the plant roofs, and that we provide an appropriate source of inorganic material. But that opens the possibility for using a green roof as a wonderful way to try and recycle materials that heretofore have ended up in waste. As Dr. Clark mentioned, one of the nicer things about all of this is that we actually have now have the ability or are underway uh, in a pilot scale demonstration project. So I just want to just spend a couple of minutes reviewing for you or showing you some before and after photos of our pilot scale project. Uh, this is the initial stages of the project. Uh, these are actually two of our students. The one in the yellow boots uh, is Abigail Mickey. Uh, she's finishing up an honors research here at Penn State this, this semester. And the, uh, the young woman uh, squatting down by our recycled media is Danielle Harrow. Uh, Danielle has now uh, left us. She got a master's in EPC and is in a graduate program at George Washington. Uh, but you can see that they both start off as pretty conventional bare fields. And this was several months later. There are no visual differences between the two. We've done chemical analysis. There are no chemical differences between the two in terms of the media itself. And finally, and this is so new that I can't, I didn't even have a chance to put the slide in. Um, as we speak, Abby and Danielle are still in my lab finishing the last of the data analysis, but it appears that there's no difference in the microbial communities with the sole exception that the recycled media has a higher and therefore healthier microbial population and should be more stable and more resistant to change. So what are we trying to do now? We're going to be looking at 
What happens with those metals in the green roofs? Uh, we've done some preliminary studies on the leachate, and at this point, we have found that there is no significant increase in runoff in zinc uh, from our green roof media, despite the presence of 10 to 15% zinc in shredded tires. We'd like to optimize the organic content so that we can incorporate biosolids into the media. And we would like to continue that pilot testing uh, under a variety of field conditions and a variety of situations. I just want to take a couple of minutes and also thank students uh, because we couldn't certainly couldn't have done this work without uh, the input of a significant number of students, both graduate students and undergraduate students. And I'd like to thank the supporters of this research. Uh, we received a startup grant from NSF PFI ITN. Uh, Abby received a summer discovery grant. The Recycling Market Center has been amazing in terms of getting us uh, Pennsylvania-based crumb rubber and Pennsylvania-based compost products uh, so that we can develop this kind of media, ideally to move it towards commercialization. And our final um, thanks goes to Vartan uh, developers for providing us the sites for our pilot testing. Thank you, Dr. Baker. And thank you very much to both uh, Dr. Clark and Dr. Baker for your very interesting uh, presentations. <clears throat> and I remind the audience that at any time you can type questions into the question block on your GoToWebinar uh, control panel. And I'd like to ask uh, uh, both of you this first question. How different would you expect results from what you're seeing using crumb rubber uh, in Pennsylvania to be similar or different in other parts of the U.S. or, or even in other countries? Um, let me ask Jack if you could repeat that exact again. So, so um, I, if, I, if I'm getting the question right, it was the issue of using crumb rubber and green roofs in this country versus or in this area versus others. Yes, the, the, that was the question. Would would you expect any difference if if it was in a different part of the U.S., for example? I don't expect from a hydraulic behavior for anything to be substantially different, um, depending on the area of the country. Um, I, I certainly know, you know, again, there's been obviously questions raised about uh, green roofs. And one of the advantages of green roofs is that they, they are planted, they evapotranspirate water back to the atmosphere. So um, some of the questions that have come up in this area and other areas of the country and world have been about potential reuse of the water coming off of this one versus other roofs. And I did put up the slide earlier and did not go very far into it. If you take a look, for example, at um, a couple of the nearby states' recommendations for rainwater harvesting, they suggest, for example, that you use galvanized metal as, a, as that. And now what, my, what our research has shown in the past on, on traditional roofing materials such as galvanized metal is that you're adding a tremendous amount of zinc to your cistern. And potentially, you know, that would be in the water requiring treatment before reuse. The green roofs certainly have a have a different concern, particularly with the nutrient issue. Even the crumb rubber was going to have an issue with the nutrient issue potentially. But the, uh, as Dr. Baker had mentioned, and I'm going to let her pick up in a second on this, is that the use of plants certainly provides an uptake of the nutrients. I'll turn it over to Dr. Baker at that point. Okay. Um, I don't think... And you know we, we we can always give the uh, the disclaimers that uh, that there's more research needed, uh, but um, I don't see any reason why um, green roofs made out of a recycled media would perform differently in another state or another country, with the following exception: any soil-based system, any soil-based system is going to perform differently depending upon the climate and weather. So if the question is, would a growing system in Pennsylvania be different from a growing system in Arizona? Yes. Would a growing system in Pennsylvania fundamentally be different? No. 
it's still the same basic biology. The nutrients are going to be the same. The dynamics of what goes on is going to be the same. Uh, to also follow up on a little bit of what Dr. Clark talked about in terms of the reuse, um, the biggest problem that I'm aware of with reuse is uh, concerns about nutrients and concerns primarily about microorganisms. What our data indicates is that with the compost recycled rubber system, there is no diff there are no significant, no detectable pathogens or indicator organisms present in the system. That said, whenever you store water in any container, there is always the potential for contamination and there is always the potential for microbial growth. So even if you just have a cistern and you directly collect rainwater, uh, you still have to worry about possible contamination with microorganisms. Okay, thank you. The next question is, can you estimate the cost per square foot for a full-scale installation using your pilot project design? I, Joe, oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I cannot do that. We are looking at the data we're actually collecting right now and working with the Recycling Market Center to do cost estimates of, of what the final mixture is. I, I know that we feel that it is going to be competitive, um, but I could not begin to give you a number compared to a to a regular green We do feel like it's going to be in that way, but we are still uh, checking the numbers with the persons from the Recycling Market Center. Okay, next question. <clears throat> For hotter climate regions, wouldn't one expect higher release of pollutants or different behavior from recycled tire material as compared with natural soil-based substrate material? I'm not sure that the, that, that, that necessarily follows. Uh, for hotter climate regions, I would expect there to be higher release of pollutants or um, higher release of materials. If by pollutants here, you're really concerned about such things as metals uh, from either the recycled tire material or the natural soil-based substrate. Um, those both, uh, leaching, association, and dissociation, is influenced by the temperature of the system. That's not, that's not um, debatable. When you're talking about the release of other pollutants, the only other pollutant you really have to worry about in the tire system is going to be um, materials that are inherent in the, in the synthetic rubber themselves. And for that, you're dealing at near incinerator temperatures. So we don't really have to worry about those unless um, the climate predictions are a lot more serious. Than, uh, than I would worry about. Okay, now the next question. Did you have anything to add to that, Dr. Clark? No, I think I certainly agree with Dr. Baker on that. And again, as you know, as again, as some of the other research by others have shown, the um, uh, plants will provide some protection of the underlying substrate. Okay, the next question. <clears throat> Crumb rubber is, an or, is a organic material. You might give a term of inert medium instead of inorganic. Inorganic rock is inorganic element supplier due to weathering as well as plant roots secrete material uh, to release the to release the minerals. You're absolutely right. Um, we should be referring to our synthetic tires as inert, non-biodegradable organic material. Uh, that said, as a microbiologist, I would argue that soil could be considered an organic matter because soil is not simply weathered rocks. That's dirt. Uh, soil is weathered rocks plus the film of organic matter that adheres to it, plus the film of water that hydrates it, plus the film of microorganisms that grow on it. 
The actual point, though, is true. Um, recycled rubber is technically, from the perspective of an organic chemist, organic material. Um, the same way that street paving is organic. But I think we all kind of get a little sloppy in our terminology and would refer to streets as being inorganic. I'll absolutely work on changing my language and using inert or non-biodegradable medium in the future. Yeah, the reason we use the term inorganic in that application, knowing full well it is an organic-based, carbon-based material, is that green roof suppliers typically refer to the organic and inorganic component in their other materials. And so from a talking to other suppliers, there was a need to use their terminology, even though we know it is technically and, and chemically incorrect. Okay, next question. Are there any local green roof examples that can be observed? Um, as of right now, we, we do not have permission to, I, I don't know if you're talking about general green roofs or this very specific green roof. Um, there are several general green roofs in the area down in the Lancaster County area. Um, Philadelphia is certainly installing several. Um, and I do know that um, some of the newer buildings going in, in downtown Harrisburg uh, around the Hack campus are beginning to pick them up. In terms of accessing and seeing this roof, particularly in this medium, um, we're still finishing out some of the testing. And I know they're dealing with that. We are going to be talking about uh, putting up signage at that building. Um, which right now cannot be, you know, we're, we're being asked not to disclose where it is, but to, and hopefully encourage public tours to come up and take a look. But I don't know since that is a private building and a private business if that's going to happen. Next question. Are sedum plants successful in green roof systems in all parts of the country? No plants are successful in all parts of the country, but sedums are the traditional plant that is used in green roofs actually for two reasons. Uh, one, green roofs were first developed um, in Switzerland and the Scandinavian countries, and sedums are indigenous to those regions. Secondly, sedums are alpine plants. Uh, that means they have two characteristics. They are tolerant to extremes in weather, and they are tolerant to drying. Um, so both of those make them good plants. The reason I gave the, the, my own personal opinion that it would be nice to start using indigenous plants, more native plants, is that if I'm growing plants in Pennsylvania, the plants that are best adapted to grow in Pennsylvania are Pennsylvania plants. And there's no reason why those shouldn't be successful on a green roof. The biggest concern has been, and I, we have not done the looking here, but I know I've got colleagues in New Zealand who have tried to use New Zealand native plants and done comparisons to sedum because it is very expensive to import sedums to New Zealand, um, has been that the extremes in water and heat on the roofs themselves have caused some problems with the native plants and have forced the native systems to require more irrigation to keep them alive. And that's certainly something, again, it would be preferred to use Pennsylvania native plants or native to your area plants some of the concerns have been, would they survive and the hardiness? We did that one. We did that one. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's, uh, that's all the questions that have been submitted. I thank uh, Drs. Clark and Baker for their fine presentations and for the audience for submitting your excellent questions. We hope you've enjoyed this Technology Tuesday webinar. We're in the process of developing the next series of Technology Tuesday webinars, and then the next webinar will be in three months. Thank you for your participation, and have a good day.